Hey there. This is a comprehensive guide to making reproduction EEPROM cartridges for the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive. There's a lot to talk about, so sit back and relax. If you've been to any video game show or convention with a vendor floor, you've probably seen it. Same thing on eBay, Etsy, and even in bulk on AliExpress and Alibaba. Reproduction cartridges and games, or in street vernacular, repros. In a certain light, there's a good and bad to the scene, as many repros are illegitimate copies made to look like the original in order to scout from the collector's market. But not all is bad. Some modders do such incredible work, some ROM hacks are so impressive they need to be honored by playing such work on original hardware. And it's not just modders making new content for legacy hardware. The legendary John Burton, programmer for Sonic 3D Blast, created a director's cut for this game 21 years post-mortem, improving many game mechanics that should have been there but could not due to tight release schedules. This is where reproduction carts gain their favorable reputation and their place in the collector's market. So, how do you make one? We're going to step through the muddy waters of how not to beat reproduction cartridges, but how to join the community, and I'm using that term loosely. What's involved in making a Sega Genesis cartridge? We'll look at the full startup costs for both basic cartridges and SRAM battery backed up cartridges. This is more a focus on a ground up approach, and because so, we'll make a PCB along the way and look at like-minded solutions as well. And to wrap up this introduction, remember, I'm not endorsing nor selling any software that you don't own. Don't copy! Don't copy that floppy! This is personal use only. This video is for educational purposes only. Because if you're like me, wondering why a complete in-box NTSC copy of Crusaders of Senti ranges from $7.99 to $6,000 on eBay, well, there's something to learn here. And spoiler, it's because of reproduction copies. Also, I see you, Etsy, in your unregulated market doing the same shady thing. So anyway, let's get started. The best place to start is the end, meaning know the end product that you want to create, and we'll work backwards on how to accomplish each step. Step one, so what ROM are we going to produce? Let's start simple here and pick a ROM that does not have a battery backup or save feature. For this example, I'm gonna go with the aforementioned Sonic 3D Blast Director's Cut. With this identified, we need to know the size of this ROM. This will determine the size of the EEPROM we need to purchase. There's a very handy website that has all this information available in a database, that being the game ROM size and if it uses save features. This site is a helpful tool to build a parts list if this is the sort of thing you're going to have a crack at over and over again. Following this practice, the vanilla Sonic 3D Blast ROM size is 4 megabytes, or in 1990s Sega marketing lingo, 32 mega power. Now, we're not using the vanilla ROM, so how do we know the size? Well, chances are, if you are following along, you have the ROM file. And you can see these file properties here on my computer. So this means the director's cut ROM after patching is four megabytes, still the same size, but more specifically, 4,094 kilobytes exactly, which is great. The means of how to get this ROM I will not discuss because reasons. I mean, you obviously own the game, dumped the contents, and patched it, which is basically this video in reverse, so we've technically covered that anyway. Our ROM size is 4 megabytes, which is more commonly referred to as 32 megabits in 1990s era specific terminology. And from now on, we're going to speak in megabit sizes as this is how the EEPROMs are identified. Knowing this, we can select the correct EEPROM to fit this game. Oh yeah, EEPROMs, what is that? That is a erasable, programmable, read-only memory chip, or integrated circuit. There's two varieties that exist in the wild. Both can be used in this case. Ultraviolet Erase, UV, is one, and that's what we have here, or the one-time programmable OTP version, which you'll probably find on every OEM Sega Genesis cartridge. Either will work, but UV is a direction we're going to choose for a couple reasons. One, if something happens when programming, we can erase it and rewrite it, so we don't essentially brick a moderately expensive chip. And two, 
Ultraviolet generally are cheaper because they're more common than the one-time programmable ROM chips. Remember, EEPROMs have been out of production for at least 20 years. The UV ROMs are a bit easier to source because genuine ones have been salvaged from boards. They can be erased, reused, and then finally resold. So they're still kind of circulating. I would recommend buying these secondhand on eBay. At the time of this video, a secondhand 32 megabit erasable EEPROM cost me $2.15. I had, did have to buy a pack of 10, but that's still a good price. Compare that to new old stock, which costs much, much more. Just to note, whatever size the ROM game is, whatever you tend in program, the EEPROM must be greater than or equal to this size. The game file has to fit in this chip's memory. Some ROMs don't match the standard EEPROM sizes, and that's okay. Just round up to the nearest size. If your game is slightly larger than 16 megabit, well, you're going to have to use the next size up, which is 32 megabit. Okay, so we need a 32 megabit UV EEPROM, or just EEPROM in this. That would be the M27C332. Is that right? Did I write that? No, that's the, <laughs> that would be the M27322. Here's a handy chart that translates part numbers and EEPROM sizes. Just note, I'm going to skip over a ton of details regarding the EEPROM itself. There's data sheets available, which you should totally check out anytime you're getting into something technical like this. But in general, for EEPROM, stick to big brands, genuine parts, and the M27 class. For brand names, I'm going to go with ST. Again, stick to brand name genuine parts. This device classification is important, and that's the M27C part. For this example and likely your scenario, you'll be using the M27C class, which is 5 volt supply, and it so happens that the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive runs on 5 volts. Pretty important detail. So you've sourced the correct EEPROM. They are hopefully blank chips, meaning you don't have to erase them. My UV eraser was lost in the mail, so I can't show you that, but there's not much outside the obvious. You give the EEPROM a 15 minute suntan in this ultraviolet easy bake oven and it erases the chip. So now we are ready to program. Ah, but first we need a programmer. And this was the first hurdle I encountered in this project that kind of stumped me. From my research, there's every type and variety of EEPROM programmer that will accomplish this task. Most examples and user recommendations I found on the internet were really just anecdotal. So I'm only going to give you the facts for the one programmer that I've used successfully for this project. I purchased a top 3000 EEPROM programmer and it's pretty generic. It did set me back $117 at the time of this video. By the way, I'm gonna have a total cost for this entire project near the end. So this programmer works and it's very no frills. Some forums that I consulted and read mentioning this programmer said the bundled software may have some shady extras that also get installed, but I cannot confirm nor deny that claim. We're really in black market territory, so maybe just get your burner PC out for all of this. Okay, I've got the programmer installed. It's just a basic USB 2.0 device. First thing we need to do is turn it on before opening the software. There's an external power supply that comes bundled with this programmer since programming these EEPROM chips usually use much higher voltages than USB levels, so we need a bit more juice to do so. Don't lose this power supply. Step two. You're going to select the chip that we're going to program. We've already identified this previously. You can do this by going to options, then select chip. Match the chip type, manufacturer, and chip model. Hopefully you stuck to brand names and got genuine parts, so everything should match here. The mantra close enough is not applicable here. If it doesn't match, you're going to have a bad time. Match the chip type, manufacturer, and chip model. I'm using ST branded EEPROMs M27C322. Next, we have to prepare the ROM. But what's there to prepare, you ask? Well, computers like their data in a specific way, and we've got a couple varieties of computers we're working with. 
Before I get into the details, let's load our ROM into the programmer application so we have a visual. This is also a very important point that if you're loading a ROM that is smaller or undersized than the EEPROM chip it's going to fit onto, this option right here where it says fill with FFF means to fill all the void or empty space with a full value hex number. This is very important because if it's empty, the ROM is likely not going to work on the Sega. The rest of these options here should remain as default as recognized by the origin of the file format. In this case, we have a bin or .gen file is gonna be a bin file. Leave everything else as default. Normal characters, buffer starts at all zero. Okay, now we can move on. We're looking at the memory address locations on the left, the hex code in the middle, the core of this ROM, and the ASCII, if it can translate to such, on the right. With the ROM loaded into the buffer, we can actually read the byte order that modern computers use. When converted to ASCII, any developer notes or text also happens to be decipherable. So what's the point? Well, burning this ROM as is will result in a non-working game cartridge. We have to byte swap the ROM first for the Genesis or Mega Drive. If parts of the ROM are legible to your human eyes, like the game header here, then the ROM is not byte swapped and will not function as a game cartridge on the Genesis or Mega Drive. Wait, what? Why? The technical term we need to prepare the ROM is called an Endian swap. This is an educational video, so strap in. Bear with this example. Some people like their sandwich constructed as bun, cheese, meat, and bun. We can all get behind that. The byte pairs in this sandwich example are the top half and bottom half of our sandwich. We're gonna call this format Little Endian and it happens to be used by most modern PC architectures. It's also why if we put this ROM in a PC emulator, everything will work just fine. However, the Sega Genesis likes Big Endian, which swaps the byte pairs. So in this odd example, that's gonna to translate to cheese, bun, bun, then meat. The Genesis or Mega Drive CPU, which is the Motorola 68000, finds this order to be a very tasty sandwich and it's not gonna consume anything but this. This little swap is what we have to do to the ROM file. Like most people who just read a Wikipedia article on something they're very unfamiliar with, I'm not gonna go into any more detail. All I can say is you'll be glad you bought the erasable EEPROMs because this byte order is the first thing I did incorrectly. It's also why you want a test PCV with a socket, but more on that later. Now you know we need to do an Indian swap, but how do you byte swap your ROM? This was yet another step that was a bit vague when researching all of this. Most EEPROM programmer applications should have this byte swapping feature built in. However, from what I can tell, mine does not. But that's okay. A Google search of Endian swap program is all we need to get us there. There are a few software tools on the web that will do this for you. I found a small application that will swap whatever you drag and drop on it. I've linked it in the description. Your mileage will vary, but either way, you need some sort of hex editor that will do a big Endian swap of your ROM. To conclude, on the left is an example of an original ROM before you do a byte swap. On the right is after we perform the big Endian swap. In the realm of best practices, it's a good idea to save your ROM with a file name identifying that it's been byte swapped. This will prevent you from burning duds. Now we are ready to program the EEPROM. We are ready to write, so it's best to cover the EEPROM's UV window to block any trace UV light that could potentially erase data. Insert your EEPROM into the programmer, verify its position is correct with whatever programmer you are using. This top 3000 has a check position tab built into the software, which provides a nifty diagram based on the EEPROM you've previously selected. If the position is correct, pull a lever on the ZIF connector to make electrical contact with all the pins. I recommend you have the programmer run all the checks as part of the write process. This means the programmer will verify the chip is blank, write the contents, and verify the contents written are correct. Be patient. This tech is very old and somewhat slow. It's actually really slow. 
Writing the ROM will take minutes, like three to five minutes, based on its size. This footage you're seeing now has been sped up. If everything went according to plan, and that's the blank was successful, the write was successful, and the contents verification was a pass, you now have a working ROM that when placed in a PCB is a working game cartridge. With a burned EEPROM, it's time to find a PCB to give this game a home. The more accessible way to a PCB is through a donor cartridge, which is a let you down easy way of saying you have to cannibalize a game to do this. To do this, you would desolder the ROM from a stock game and then solder your burned EEPROM to the donor PCB. This requires some skill and patience if you don't have the best tools. It's also a somewhat taboo subject to kill a piece of history to make an illegitimate copy of a game. But Ryan, who's going to miss Virgin Interactive's Caesar's Palace if it's salvaged for part? Well, probably no one, but we have some principles here. So what do we do? Well, we can make one, but not totally from scratch. Well, sort of. Conveniently enough, HD Retrovision has a EagleCAD file for a Genesis cartridge. I know, free stuff on the internet, can it be that good? Well, it is good. I did make some changes, however. I removed the flash memory module because we're purists here. We are not going to use that. We're using EEPROMs. I also added the mounting holes for electronic arts cartridges. This PCB has a wide compatibility with many EEPROM sizes. You just need to solder the appropriate jumper for whatever EEPROM you're using. I'm going to keep that feature but change some of the layout and silkscreen labels. So after these changes, I had to get a few boards made. A couple of note about PCBs with edge connectors, which is what this cartridge is. There are two important manufacturing notes. The surface finish should not be the standard or cheapest hot air solder leveling. We need a more uniformly flat and durable coating on these edge connector contacts. For areas prone to high wear, it's got to be immersion gold at minimum, which is significantly more money when getting PCBs made. If you love your Genesis, then you know it's worth it. I love gold! Second note, this edge connector should be beveled for ease of insertion. Check with your board manufacturer to make sure they can do this. At this point, if you've not verified anything you've done actually works, you should make a test PCB. It's highly recommended you make a PCB that has a socket. This will make the EEPROM removable for testing and verification purposes. In the event that your EEPROM is a dud, if you've soldered it to a board, well, it's very difficult to remove it once it's soldered. With a tester PCB, you can insert your EEPROM, don't solder it, that's what the socket's for, and make sure the game boots. After that, you can solder the EEPROM into an actual PCB. And that could be one that you've made from a PCB fabrication or one that you are using as a donor from a lesser appreciated game. We can't leave this PCB naked, it just doesn't look finished. It needs a case. The final stretch here actually sours me the most. Aftermarket shells are somewhat abundant and easy to come by, but by no means are they cheap. I shopped around a bunch. On eBay and Etsy, I found resellers with ABS molded cases for up to $7, sometimes even up to $15 for just one reproduction cartridge shell. Even though electric green looks really cool, I just can't stomach that price at this point. So we're going to shortcut this and find their supplier. Turning to Alibaba and AliExpress is the next option, but still you have to buy in bulk here and wait 25 to 35 days to receive that order. I'm at the point where I want to start capping costs on this project and I don't really have any more time to wait for parts to arrive. So unfortunately, I'm not taking the plunge on this one. However, if you have purchased reproduction cartridges for the Genesis, let me know if what that quality is like. I'm still curious to see where this goes. Okay, so our alternative option is, again, conveniently, HD Retrovision. They do have a STO file of a molded Sega Genesis case, two halves of the shell. So as crazy as it sounds, we're going to try and 3D print one. I'm going for a look that doesn't look 
3D printed. So I'm gonna use a SLA 3D printer. This cures resin with a UV light. The only catch is it takes some time to wash, cure, and then sometimes rewash in alcohol, the final product to remove any residual stickiness from the resin. A sticky game cartridge is gross and it doesn't feel good. So when all that's done, the results are okay. There's a bit of warping from the printing and sadly the curing process. So there's a lot of internal stresses on this thin resin after it's cured. And I'm not in love with the look of these having seen the injection molded alternative, even just pictures, they look better than this. So sadly, this is where I have to say, I'm gonna be a hypocrite. We're gonna borrow, not salvage, but borrow the shell of a factory game and remove the label. I will, however, preserve the donor game ROM and its original PCB by leaving it intact and transplanting it into one of these 3D printed shells so it can live its life in peace. Regarding the label and cover art, I've done artwork tutorials already, and you can check out those videos if this is something you want to pursue there. I'm going to skip artwork for now since I can't easily get to a colored printer at this time. The coverproject.net is a great place to start sourcing for scans of game cover assets. I'm just going to do this and call it a day. That's nice work. Before I ruin the fun factor of this project telling you about costs, let's enjoy the fruits of our labor. I removed the case for those skeptical that any of this works. I admit I had my doubts too, but this is the EEPROM we burned on the PCB we made running on original hardware. Okay, let's talk about costs at this point. I'm gonna call this first category total investment cost. That means you're convinced this is something you wanna do, but you're gonna to need to invest into buying some tools to get started. This was my case and the critical tool I needed was the EEPROM programmer. I bought the rest of the parts in bulk in a quantity of 20 to be exact. So all these combined, that's our investment. Aside from cartridge shells, which I'm still not sure about, I have 20 EEPROMs and 20 PCBs. That makes our total investment $229. Yeah, so that means to make one game, one Sonic 3D Blast Director's Cut, we are at $229. Definitely worth it. Following economies of scale, if all goes well and I make 19 other working carts, we can bring this cost down per game. I'm going to add another $2 per game as a base cost for replacement cartridge shells since these need a case. So investment or startup cost for 20 of these is around $12.50. That's the economies of scale working for us. That's not terrible. What if you already have the EEPROM programmer or just don't count that as part of the cost? Then for a batch of 20 repros, you're looking at $7 per game in parts. This is a small production run quantity, mind you. $7 per game is the ceiling for small batches. The whole point of this is to put some perspective on the reproduction market. Either ROM hacks that are impossible get into physical form or illegitimate games meant to look like the real thing, you should be armed with this knowledge the next time you're walking into a vendor market. If buying repro is your thing, you should know what you're paying someone to recuperate their parts cost. The rest of that money, allegedly, is what they're going to pocket. But Ryan, you've spent this entire video and you still haven't shown me Sega Genesis cartridges with battery backed SRAM and with working safe features. Oh yeah, sure, let's do that then. I've saved the best for last, unless you've just skipped to this part. But finally, we have one last topic to discuss and that's games that support battery backup and or save features. A few Sega Genesis Mega Drive games support this. Remember our Genesis Mega Drive database website from earlier? Well, that's a really good place to reference any games that have built-in save features. This is where a lot of reproduction sellers offer these games. However, some are unfortunately sold on basic PCBs without the necessary components to support that save functionality. I don't understand much of what's going on with carts that use SRAM, so we're going to have to rely on others' work to get this done. This is where I found a reproduction board made by Mr. Tentacle on Tindy, which supports ROM sizes up to 32 megabit, that's 4 megabytes, and most importantly, SRAM features and save capabilities. There are other sellers that offer boards like this, but this is the only one that I've tested. 
This is a prime candidate for what I think is the holy grail of Sega ROM hacks in a physical cartridge, and that's Sonic 3 Complete. In short, this is the history lesson, before Sonic 3 and Knuckles were split into two games because of the holiday retail deadlines, they were actually planned as one massive game. The Sonic 3 ROM hack means to stitch these two back together with some original level orders among hundreds of other features that were left on the cutting room floor. This game needs SRAM because the original Sonic 3 uses save features, and looking at the Sonic 3 cart, we know that because, well, it's there's something special going on on this PCB. Okay, so we have this special PCB that was purchased on the Tindy market and the instructions included, which are kind of vague, but that's with most taboo topics like this. The seller does provide a parts list to populate this PCB, and that's all we have to go on. I bought these parts in bulk because, you know, why buy one when you can buy nine and then get the tenth free? So again, investment costs, whatever. However, this is where a bit of electrical knowledge really helps down to track the right variations and the right series of some of these integrated circuits. And that's really the purpose of the video. If it's really hard to gather all this information together, feel confident that the end result is gonna work. Here's all those parts and the associated DigiKey part numbers. You are welcome. Assembling this PCB costs about $10 in just parts alone. We're ignoring like some of the investment stuff of Again, the EEPROM programmer and the fact that I bought, you know, 10 times this amount. That investment's a little more. But I like hoarding electronics, so I don't mind having parts on hand. So when it's all said and done, I'm ecstatic to report that everything works. I ended up, you know, playing this game all the way through. Um, and here's that save, like, about three weeks later, it's still there. If you add a case to this, which you should, it's gonna push your parts cost to around $12. And honestly, to have this variation of Sonic 3 and Knuckles, the Sonic 3 Complete, this is really an astonishing feat in retrospect, and it wouldn't be possible without such a big community that is into reproduction cartridges and also provides the means to do some of the hard things with things they sell. Hey everybody, welcome to the outro. I'm gonna answer some common questions that you probably have. So why not just use an EverDrive? Well, that's an option. The cost of this entire endeavor has, you know, met and exceeded the cost of an EverDrive. So I get from like a feasibility standpoint, just do it. I like retro gaming for the cost and inconvenience. This fills a void, a dream I could never satisfy when I was younger, growing up in the 90s, and you know, long for having every game for the Sega. Uh, where do I get ROMs? Well, that's very simple. Um, buy the actual cartridge, take it apart, uh, desolder the ROM, and dump its contents using this programmer I showed you. That's, that's the only way. What about ROM hacks? Uh, the best resources I found is romhacking.net. Uh, it's an entire website where all the patches are available. There are no ROMs, so I, I think for the longevity of the site, it's always going to be in good standing as well as a built-in web patching tool to make those patched ROMs, which can be kind of confusing if, uh, if you've never done it before. I also have some odds and ends that I didn't really know where to put in the video, and there are still helpful hints if you take on this endeavor. I think my biggest issue was uh, committing to this project, and that means like not knowing if the ROM's gonna work. You have to solder it to a PCB to actually see if it does. If you've ever been like the design or R&D phase, which this whole thing felt like it, you might wanna put sockets on every single chip that you're not willing to sacrifice. Some of these chips like the SRAM are like $2.75 each, and it's hard to commit to soldering an entire PCB not knowing it will work. Well, you can't socket everything because it won't fit in the OEM Sega Genesis cases. So if you do socket stuff like your test PCB, if you're just verifying the ROM was correctly written. You can't use a shell, and sometimes depending on your construction, you might just have to have the the top of your Sega Genesis come off so you can fit everything in that cartridge slot. So I did mention earlier that I, I'm a hypocrite, and I want to say I'm also a liar. So I said I wanted to cap prices on this project, so I wasn't going to buy those neon green reproduction shells. Well, 
I did. And uh, I was really hesitant on it because the seller, I think, used like a potato to take a photo of the product. And I was always, I wasn't sure if like it was any good. So I ended up just committing because whatever. And when I got these in the mail, uh, they they look really quite good. It's it's very evident that the that someone somewhere either inherited or purchased the original tooling for the Sega Genesis cartridges because the uh, Made in Japan marked ones have the original embossment of the Sega logo and the patent numbers, which is totally unnecessary for something that's being reproduced like 30 years post-mortem. Uh, so overall, these cases look really good. Are they worth $3.70 each? Uh, that's for you to decide. Um, again, this is a, a nostalgia thing. The way I see this is it takes me back to when I was like nine years old. So sometimes that cost doesn't matter because it's about the feeling. So I mentioned a pretty expensive game as like the hook in the beginning of this, and that was Crusaders of Senti, uh, which is a pretty common reproduction game based on its rarity and then inflated price to get a hold of that game. So that game uses SRAM, and I had a little bit of issues like getting it to work on one of the SRAM reproduction PCBs. So in general, so in conclusion, don't solder the 7474, that's a D-type flip-flop, I see to that board. I didn't know a lot what's going on, so I reached out to the seller asking like, what should I do? That was his recommendation, so I begrudgingly had to desolder this chip, and it ended up working. So I'll show some footage of that game working, because again, if the save function doesn't work in this cartridge type format, what's the point of having them? So getting that to work was a big deal, and I think Crusaders of Senti is pretty a common a collector's like holy grail to actually get that, that cartridge or some form of it working. Okay, so that's really all I have to say. This was a like a two or three month long project just because uh, all the different parallel paths I had to take of uh, sourcing a couple different PCBs, getting a bunch of parts, testing things to make sure they work, making my own PCB, uh, gambling on that working, waiting for that shipping, and getting other reproduction cartridges uh, ordered, 3D printing my own. The artwork is a totally another topic, which again, I've, I've done some artwork tutorials before so check those out if you're interested in like making your own artwork or just learning like the basic how to's to navigate a CAD program that deals with vector artwork. So if you made it this far thanks so much for watching hopefully this video helped you and it at least tries to level the playing field if you're going to either dive into reproduction cartridges or consider buying them. There's some things you should know as far as you know what's a reseller's cost. So anyway as always, don't copy that fluffy. Thanks for watching. Welcome to the end of the computer age. <laughs>